you doing, people? How you doing? This is James Bayfield, America's number one short sale debt negotiator, your foreclosure expert, your foreclosure defense expert. Listen, you know, I was out today, I was in the field, I was communicating with a few real estate investors, I was communicating with a few real estate brokers, I was considered with a few experts in the industry. And um, one of the, the main questions I keep on running to me is like, is one of the main challenges that kept on happening to, throughout the whole day today is, is that the real estate investor doesn't understand the foreclosure cycle. The real estate broker doesn't understand the foreclosure cycle. They don't understand the litigation. They don't understand this because no one has sat down to educate them about the process. Anyway, this is a specialized video, right? A specialized video for the, the guys that I saw today in New York, in Queens, and in the, in the, in the area, that, uh, Nassau County, that um, I spoke to today. And um, I'm just putting a little video together for you where I'm going to discuss litigation, foreclosure, short sales, closing, auction, uh, ways to stop foreclosure, a note purchase, property transfer, and property research. I'm going to basically break down these quick modules for you. Now, it's not going to be a long video, but this is very vital. This is very important to your business. You need to understand this because you're missing opportunity to profit. You're missing the opportunity to help people or you are risking your reputation by taking a, a, a certain business that you have no business taking. Listen, don't tell people you're going to save their home from foreclosure to loss mitigation as if that's not what you do as a business, right? Don't do that. That's bad, that's bad business. That's misrepresentation. Don't do that. All right, if you're a real estate investor, your whole objective is to buy property from distressed homeowners, say that. That's what you do. I buy real estate from distressed homeowners. I buy distressed property. I buy distressed property from homeowners. What does that mean? Well, a property that's currently 90-day delinquent. That property, homeowner is not distressed. They've been out of place. They lost their job. They lost their income. That property now is getting ready to start going to a, a foreclosure proceeding, right? A foreclosure proceeding, people, is a, it's a lawsuit. That's the first thing I need you to get clear. It's a lawsuit, all right? It's a lawsuit just like any lawsuit. If you got into a car accident, an attorney must represent your interests or vice versa, the other party, a plaintiff, a defendant, where they, they must initiate a lawsuit at their court, a local courthouse, local, local jurisdiction, if they don't reach some kind of settlement. At formality, you will have to start an action, then you will attend what we call a preliminary conference, where we agree into a stipulation to discontinue the action. For, for record. Do you understand? So anyway, my name is James Bayfield. I'm America's number one short set debt negotiator. I've been in the real estate business for the last 13 years. I've been to the good cycle, the bad cycle. I done, I done had a lot of losses. I had partners. We had disputes, right? But one thing I've always done is kept my dignity, kept my integrity, right? The reason I was able to keep my integrity and my dignity because the knowledge that I have. See, folks, not, a lot of people don't believe in continuing education, but I'm going to be the first person to tell you. you got to educate yourself outside what you learn from just buying, buying and selling real estate. If you're planning to have any kind of advancement in the industry, you have to do some advanced training. you got to hire a consultant to come educate you on the things you need to educate yourself in, especially if you're aggressive. A lot of guys just want to make money. There's nothing wrong with making money. We get in, this is investments. Do you understand? The whole objective is to make money. It's not to buy property, sit on the property, hoping and pray things happen. These are the mistakes that I made, right? I got into business. I bought, I bought property, low prices, to what I'm getting ready to discuss in a few minutes, to the short sale negotiation process, to the note purchase position process. But someone told me that real estate was a wealth building tool. <laughs> someone told me real estate was a wealth building tool. You know, I'm going to be honest with you, people. It sounds attractive. It sounds sexy. But when you deal with real estate on a small scale, on a residential scale, I don't consider real estate as a wealth uh, preservation tool. It's really not. Because just as fast the value goes up, 
just as fast as value goes down. What happened? I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you bought a property today that, that value $400,000. You put down $100,000. You have a debt balance in that property that's $300,000. Let's say, for instance, to bad, uh, bad economy, bad situation that you could not even control or foresee. Now your property value dropped down um, to $300,000. What happened to your $100,000 you put down? That money is gone. You can't get that money back because equity is the value of your property minus the debt that's currently on the property. That's what, you, that's what we call that net worth. We call that the value left of the property. That's what you got, that's what you got to work with. Do you understand? Know so if I have a property that's worth $650,000 and I owe the bank $400,000, I have an equity of $450,000. All right, that equity is what I call phantom wealth. It's not really real wealth until I extract it. Now, this is another myth they'll tell you. They'll tell you, oh, you know what? <laughs> huh. Today, the, the currency, the dollar lost its value of China, this other uh, foreign country, whatever. Listen, don't fall for that. If you broke, you disgusted, it, you ain't got no money, that's the last thing you're going to be incinerated in your mind. You broke, man. You're worrying about taxes, you ain't got no money to pay taxes on. <laughs> you're worried about uh, stuff that you, you know, that you can't control. Don't worry about the dollar. Trust me, the United States government will take care of their business. Those guys in Congress, they're going to do their job. Anyway, I didn't mean to go that far, go far left on this thing. because I just, These are the things I want you to understand because this video is going out to a lot of people on YouTube, a lot of people uh, across the marketplace. I need you guys to understand this because we, we all make these mistakes, right? We, left, we leave our equity on the property. And we don't understand it's phantom. It's not really even real, really real. Because if a disaster happened, if some dude come burn your house down, something happened, your value is, go is going to leave you. That money is gone. Cash is king. Let me tell you something. If you run into some legal problem right now, you go to see an attorney about your legal problem, he's going to want to return it. Do you, do you think he wants to hear about, oh, I got some cash flow coming from this building. I can write you a check for $500 next month. No, he don't want to hear that nonsense. He said, Mr. Bayfield, I need a check for $10,000. Mr. Bayfield, I need a check for $25,000 as a retainer. When that money is depleted, I'm going to need another check for another $25,000. Do you understand what I'm saying? So don't squeeze yourself. Don't put yourself in a bad situation. Take your cash out and park your cash somewhere else. Do you understand? Park it where you have control of it. Because I'm telling you, as I drive by, I see some properties, right? You see the property look distressed. Right, good property, but it's distressed. The paint is peeling off. The stucco is coming off. The roof looks like it's about to come off. And this is this is like this is property. You could you could say you could look at it. You said, man, this property was was recently renovated in the last five to ten years. Why it look like that? How come the uh, the property owner doesn't contact a contractor to you know paint it up? You know, what I'm saying paint it up, uh, spruce it up. You know, what I mean, make it look attractive so you could get some uh, good tenants in there. We don't, uh, because now once the property start going, going haywire, start looking um, in a condition that's not so desirable, now you got vacancy. You got two or three vacancy because that property is no longer attracting people. When the property is not start looking a certain way now, it's not attracting good tenant. It's not even attracting retail customers. There's no money being made. See, if that property owner would have taken all that cash out, right, take that cash, take it to Chase Bank, City Bank, any of the banks, you know what, I'm putting my, you know what, I take all your cash, put it in, put it in the mattress, <laughs> right? You would have access to your capital so you could do what you need to do. Because I'm pretty sure that same buyer, the same owner of the property, right, went to Chase Bank, said, Mr. Bank, you know what, um, I have a property here on X, X Street and uh, XYZ Street, you know, I need to get, I need to pull out $40,000 for the purpose of renovation. You know what they want to do? They want to pull your credit. They want to see your income. They want to see your reserve. They want to see can you make the payments. See, do you really want to go through that process to get your money out the bank? It's like going to the bank and saying, you know what, I got $300,000 in my account. You asked me for two or three for my ID just for me to get my money out. It makes no sense. Put your cash somewhere so you can have access to your cash, so you can do your property improvement, so you can make your monthly payments. But if your money is tied up into that real estate, into the equity in this position, you think you you wealthy because some dude tell you, oh, that's how you build wealth. Go buy some real estate, build wealth. Hogwash. All right? Get your cash. 
have any fun in your socks. <laughs> you know, you, you, you might well just buy life insurance or health insurance or some kind of other, other form of insurance. Cash is king. Cash is king, right? Put your equity at the property. Maintain the property for cash flow. Even if you break even, you break even. You have depreciation. You got tax write-off. To me, that's what I call wealth. That's what I call wealth. Anyway, let's go. <laughs> I, had, I had to break this sentence. So anyway, let's talk about the foreclosure. When a person goes to foreclosure, what happens? That means they didn't follow the principle we just talked about. That means they have no cash. Because they have no cash, nobody's willing to give you cash. When you go buy a piece of property, piece of property what's the first thing they, the broker asks you? How much are you putting down? Are you, can you put 10% down? Can you put 25% down? Can you put 30% down? Are you an investor? You got to put, can you pay all cash? What do you say? I have a piece of property over here. I have this over here. Well, you know, guess what? Your credit got, done took a beating. Even the government can't help you. Your credit done took a beating so bad, it's like you can't qualify. You got missed payments here and there, left and right, because you had no cash to make the payments. Your partner's pissed off at you. Everybody aggravated at you. Like, you were spinning. You were spinning, you didn't even know how to react to it. It happened so fast, we didn't, the investor didn't know how to react to it. Investor just lost all their wealth. When you meet a guy say, well, let's say, well, uh, Mr. Bayfield, I lost $2 million in, in this and that property. What he really saying, Mr. Bayfield, I had, I had about $1.6 million of equity in four or five different properties. You know, for some reason, I was listening to these guys on TV or watching, reading those books in Barnes & Noble and Amazon.com. I didn't take my equity out on time. As a result, you know, I really got no money to service his debt. Now, because of that, the bank initiated what we call a list pendants in my property. They initiated a summons and they served me a, a summons and complaint, which is the first part of the foreclosure process. They must serve you a lawsuit, a summons and complaint. They must come together. Right? They go to the local courthouse, they buy me an index number. In New York, it's two hundred and ten dollars. Ten dollars, two hundred and ten dollars. They serve and they hire a process server. Who they pay anywhere from fifty dollars to one hundred and fifty dollars, all right, to serve you this document. Once this document has been served upon you directly by personal delivery or other method pursuant to CPLR three hundred eight, which is the statute for New York State Civil Practice Rule and Law, according to that structure, they fill out an affidavit of service saying that where we serve X Y Z by personal delivery. And here's a description of this person. All right, here's uh, all the detail about the person. This is the time we served the person. Now it gets filed at the county court, at the county, at the clerk office. Now this now, now they have jurisdiction over you, because they have jurisdiction over you and your property. Now they could move along with the process. The second step that must be done, once you've been served, we have 30 days. You were served by person delivered someone. I mean, someone puts the prop, the paperwork in your hand, the summons and complaint in your hand. You have 20 days, 20 days to answer that summons. If you do not answer that summons within 20 days, you are in default, my friend. That means that's when you start losing your rights. That's when the bank start getting all these advantage, all the benefits. They're hoping that you answer, you know, answer the, the complaint. It's been saying, it's been said that 70, 80 percent of homeowner does not answer that summons and complaint. That's why when I hire a foreclosure defense attorney, we have to make magic. We have to go through all these processes just trying to, try to get this um, um, default vacated because we have to say you were never served. And the judge, and we have to basically bring, uh, request a Travis hearing, come with all kind of um, creativity just to get, to get you an opportunity to be heard. All right? Let's say that um, you, you, you were smart enough, you were served. You, you went to the law office, hey, I've been served, a uh, uh, summons and complaint. I would like for you to protect my, um, my rights. That's all you're really doing is protecting your rights. By protecting your rights, you automatically buy time for you to get your act together. Because, see, when you're home and the homeowner's home, they're going through all this process in their head, they're trying to figure a way out. Sometimes you just need somebody to give you a word. That's why I create motivational CDs. You need somebody to give you a word of encouragement. You know, I, I was one of, 
I was at one of my man's office today, one of my brother's office today, one of the real estate, my client's office today. He goes, uh, babe, hey, man, wake up, man. You know, when I was 20 years old, you know, you know, I got arrested. I went to jail. But you know what? I'm married today. I got a wife and kid today. I deserve another shot. I need another opportunity. Hey, man, go ahead, man. Do your thing, man. Hey, let's, let's, let's do what we do. So sometimes that message alone, that tonality alone, enough to wake another person up. Say, hey, hey, man, I shouldn't feel sorry for myself. So I only made 20 grand last year. So I only sold three or four properties last year. You know what? Hey, man, let's go. Sometimes that needs to happen. Sometimes the attorney will give them that motivation and say, you know what? This is what you need to do. Let me go ahead and try to get you a loan modification. Let me go ahead and try to litigate for your behalf. Let me go ahead and try to negotiate with your behalf. How about, how about what did you do before this? How did you get in this property? How did you do this? How did you do that? So by doing this alone, and your rights can be protected. So now, summons and complaint has been served upon you. You have a duty to file an answer within 20 days. All right? You got to file an answer with your affirmative defense, your counterclaim, and your deny the stuff you're going to admit, the stuff that you don't have any knowledge of. It's that simple. Now, guess what? You file that out of the court. You mail a copy to the opposing counsel. Right? They got a copy, one at the court. You got one for your record. Now your rights is being protected. You know what I'm saying? People need to understand that. That's, what, that's the process. You need to understand that. After that's done, we go into what we call discovery. Discovery mode. Meaning that prove to me that you have all your paperwork in place. Mr. Plaintiff Attorney, Chase Bank, Bank of America, other bank. Prove to me that you, you, you have the rights to initiate the lawsuit against me. But that's what the problem is called discovery. And a lot of people don't go through discovery. Because the first step, first thing, they're in default because they didn't file a motion for leave. They didn't ask the court for more time to file an answer. They didn't give the court any reasons. You're right. They didn't even file any uh, motions to vacate the judgment, to, uh, to do anything. So because they don't have an attorney. Because this is, this is a, a foreign language, people. Legalese is foreign. You got to go to school for this stuff. I went to school for this. I didn't read a book. You cannot just read a book and learn this stuff. You got to go to school for it as an ABA paralegal training or on what the law school or some other, some other law program that I might know, might not know about. But these are the people that have this knowledge of paralegals, litigation paralegals, and attorneys. Because this is specialized knowledge. Because to understand the code, how the formality of the code, the, the forms you got to use, and how you present them. You go to the courthouse, they give you some basic forms. You might, you might be able to mix some headway with some of these forms. But it's best to go to the law library, you know, or take a class, a training course, so you can understand how this process works, so you can be protected. Again, the lawsuit is won and lose at the, and discovery. It's, it's about what can be proven. Because if they say you owe them X amount of money and you dispute it, they have, to, they have to prove it. The burden is on them to prove that they didn't break the law, they gave you all the disclosure, they didn't overcharge you, all these different things. So now, by you challenging your, the, this process, now guess what? The, the, the judge responsibility and job is to make sure everything is in order. That's why in New York State we have a, a statute called CPLR 3408. It's, a, it's, it's entitled every homeowner's a settlement conference. The whole reason behind it is to, is, is to, uh, to have a good faith negotiation with you and your lender. Sit down. I don't care if you take two, two meetings, three meetings, four meetings. As we go through a loan modification process and uh, make sure that my paperwork doesn't get lost. If it does get lost, we're going to find out. We're going to make someone accountable for it. So they make their plaintiff attorney accountable for this paperwork. So that's the only, way you go, that's the only place you're going to get some real justice. All right, so now. Summons and complaint has been filed. It's been served upon you. You're filing an answer. Now you go to discovery. Yeah, you start making your own demand. I want to see the promissory note. All right. I want to. I want to see this. I want to see this paper. I want to see that paper. And that's drag things out because they have to respond within a certain time. If they don't respond within a certain time, there's a way to penalize them. Right? There's a way to penalize them. And they're gonna ask you, "What do you want?" I say, "Well." 
What do I want? I want my principal re to be reduced. What do I want? I want this uh, this mortgage to be rescinded because it was fraud. It was predatory. It was all kind of nonsense. It, it was all kind of laws violated. All right. All right. Just remember when, when a case is in the Supreme Court, they cannot. They only have a few remedy for you. They cannot force a lender, right, to discount your mortgage. They, that cannot happen. But what they can do, work something out, right. But before someone give you something in this country, you need to have some kind of leverage. One, two parties going through a divorce, often you'll hear that the wife making allegations as such, oh, he touched my son, oh, he touched my daughter, oh, he beat my daughter. He, hey, you see all these kind of things get happens because somebody wants to get some leverage. Somebody wants somebody to communicate. At the end of the day, folks, the judge makes the decision based on law and evidence. So there's no reason to be afraid, all right? It's law and evidence. If you have a good attorney that's real technical, that's know his case laws, that knows the procedure, it'll get you what you want. A good negotiator, everything always comes to tuition. All right? So, summons a complaint. You go to a preliminary conference. You sit down, basically, whatever, whatever you want. You always should know what you want before you start the process. If you're a real estate investor, you're going to object and say, you know what, I want the deed. I want the bank to give me a short sale at an amount that I want. Then you go to the short sale route. If you're a homeowner, you're going to the objective. It's to get the bank to reduce the principal on their loan, reduce the interest rate, so, you can, so this property can make sense to you. I, I got news for you. It ain't going to happen in the Supreme Court. You know, because the Supreme Court don't have jurisdictions on certain things. But when it comes to, like, federal loans, the loan itself, that's under the federal uh, jurisdiction. So you're going to have to start your own action in federal court to get what you want in federal court. If you can't, if you can't, if you had no success and Supreme Court. You're hoping that they come to their senses, they want to work things out, because usually they want to work things out, because they don't want to drag things, because it costs them more because they have all these guys standing uh, alone in their portfolio. They restrict them, they have tax issue, government regulation issue they have to deal with, so they want to work things out. But if you have any warrant to a situation that you have to start, uh, um, you know, an action in Supreme Court, I mean federal court, there are about 14 causes of action that you could use and you're pleading to start to get to get to be heard in Supreme and federal courts, and to get to get some results, to get some kind of some kind of compromise, some kind of settlement. So it's very important to have understand this legal stuff, right? Again, if you go to um, if you go to discovery, and everything is every discovery is completed, the plaintiff must make a motion for summary judgment. If a motion for summary judgment is made, that means the, the case is over. You could um, object to it, do a cross motion, all right, and uh, or you could let it go. If the judge approved their motion, they have to, now the next thing they got to do, they got to contact the referee to cal do calculation to schedule a sale. That's the process. That's the process for New York State, right? So this process could take. Two years, three years, four years, right? It could take that kind of that that type of time. It's depend on the parties. If the plaintiff is aggressive, is motivated, is getting things done, then it could happen happen fast. If the defendant is is fighting every situation, you know, fighting back left and right and opposing all this and that, then um, it delays as well, right? So that's the process. Once the referee calculate this this um all the numbers, pennies to the pennies, then they set a, a, a auction schedule, all right? Then the investors come out and bid. In New York, every Friday, uh, in Queens County, it's an auction, 11 o'clock. Bring all cash, require 10% of cash to bid on a, you bring the 10% check, certified check, made out to the referee. You gotta find out who the referee is. Made it out, don't make it out to the bank because you're gonna, you're gonna have some issues. Right, you could bring. I believe you could bring cash. I'm not sure. I wouldn't advise you bring cash, but some people may do. Or bring a certified check. Keep it blank so you can get a blank certified check so you can make it to whoever you may need to. But it need to be 10% of the total amount. You say, well, how much am I paying on bidding? Well, you should have an idea what kind of property you're going to be bidding. You should do your homework. All right. The way you do that, you could buy a pre foreclosure list from a, a foreclosure listing service. 
uh, auction, uh, uh, which also provide an auction list, so you know which properties are going to auction, so you can do your research before you go into the auction. All right. Again, once um, a summons and complaint has been filed on that property, it's called a list pending. All right. A list pending is not attached to the property, which is that information that's been sold to a third party. That's why you have a guy sending you let sending the letters out. That's why you have a guy knocking on those doors. People like your baby say, well, you know, how can I get their list before everybody else get their list? It's very simple. Contact the credit bureaus, right? They sell information. Anybody that's two months delinquent on their mortgage, you best believe in 90 days something's going to start happening for them. 90 days so you can start contacting that list. That's the best list because from the, uh, the credit bureau know because the, the, the lenders are reporting that information, all right? So that's why you want to do that. Someone's a complaint. Foreclosure. Uh, list pendants, after they go to list pendants, they become an auction, go to auction, after they be, uh, at the auction, if, they, if no one is bid the price that the bank is, uh, the bank or the plaintiff is looking for, they become an REO, REO, real estate owned, right? That's another, end, that's an out, not opportunity for you to make money, for someone else to make money, all right? And REO, a lot of realtors today want to be an REO agent because they want to sell a house to the open market and that's their business. Right, Oreo Bank would have what we call asset managers, where they contact them. Their job is to manage the inventory the bank got back from the auction that was not sold. They have a directory of realtors already that they're really comfortable with. You'll go and eject try to get in this, those kind of lists if that's your business. Me, this type of work doesn't fit my personality because I'm a corporate guy. All right, so that, I would never do such a thing. Every now and then, I would have an asset manager contact me because I have an inventory that they know that I'm a lit litigation type person that they know they don't want no problem. They want to work things out. We work things out. <laughs> All right. Again, let's talk about the short sale right quick. Short sale. All right. If the borrower is 90 day delinquent or more, they qualify for a short sale. But as of today, 2013, April 2013, most lender will start a short sale on a property if the borrower have a real hardship. It all start with the hardship. Real hardship, good hardship, I lost my job, I'm going through a divorce, right? I can no longer give you any kind of money. My property is upside down, that's a hardship, right? You can start the procedure right there and then. It saves the bank money, saves the aggravation, and uh, they might even offer you money to vacate the property. It's called to give them the deed to the, to the lender. That's an option, all right? The most important thing is the hardship letter. The next thing, you're gonna need the financial statement that shows that you don't, your income and expenses uh, that you're currently earning right now, all right? Show that you have no income, whatever. And then the third is your financial statement, of, I, mean, I mean, your uh, pay stubs that you currently work for your job. If you don't have a job, if the bar don't have a job, just get a statement from, uh, from the bar, a notarizing statement sent to the bank, my bar, my client, I'm, so some sales are currently do not work right now, and um, this another rise, and that that's to suffice. And the pay stubs, bank statements, uh, w, uh, uh, copy of the listing agreement, which is very important. The bank like to see a property get listed by a licensed real estate broker. They want the property to be marketed because most of this, the bank people you're going to talk to, they servicing companies, and they have a duty to the investor to show to make sure that property was got a fair chance to uh, hit the market and, and everybody competed for the property and they got the best price. They want to see that. Uh, the next, you want to have a HUD-1 statement, which basically um, comprised of the contract, sales contract price, the, ex inc the expenses uh, on the seller side, and the you know, purchase price, down payment on, on the buyer side, on the borrower side, and um, what the bank will net, what, what the first bank gonna get, if there's second lien involved, how much are they gonna receive in that process? So the net sheet is very important. The net, we call that a net sheet, a hard one sheet. And the bank also gonna want you to um, give them a, a purchase agreement and an offer letter, which is very important. But to get the process going, when you meet with the client, you wanna get a contract signed, so you uh, wanna get a contract signed, you want to get the HUD one um, going. You want to collect the pay stubs, the bank statements, all the formality originating the loan, and you want to fill out the 4506T. 
which is a request of, uh, that bar last two years tax return. They want to see that, all right? That's a short sale in a nutshell, all right? Of course, there's most details, more other things that come in place. They want to schedule a BPO, of course. They want, they want uh, sometimes these days, they, they're using an appraiser to get values. So the, the numbers are going to be tight. That's the reason why it's best sometimes, if you're an investor, buy, just buy the note and get a deed in lieu, um, pay the homeowner to vacate, that, like any lender would do, just to move the process along. All right, we talked about auction. Uh, auction required to uh, make a bid on the property. 10% was required. We have 30 days to close. If you don't close in 30 days, all right, it's a possibility to get an extension. Then if you don't close, it might give you an ad additional extension for a cost, for a fee, or they might just keep your money, forfeit your money. So don't go to an auction unless you're serious, you got money, you got your pre-approval uh, from a lender ready to go, you got private money ready to go so you can pay this thing in cash, move forward, all right? Let's talk about closing a short sale. Closing a short sale, um, as an investor, always use cash. Always use all cash to close those transactions because you want to be in compliance today. You don't want to create a situation where you're not being in compliance. Always use cash. You could use traditional funding or you could use a hard money lender that will charge you 14% uh, interest rate, charge you three points of the loan, or you could get a partner, you could split it 50-50. Keep it very simple. Straightforward deal. All right. Um, let's talk about ways to stop uh, foreclosure. We talk about litigation earlier. Let's talk about ways. If you enter the game late, you're a real estate investor, you're a real estate broker, you enter the game late. If you enter the game late, and um, it's like nine months, 12 months, and they're just not calling you just out there. Someone else had to deal, they didn't, they didn't do both. They didn't do litigation and negotiation simultaneously. Excuse me. Then you have to file what we call, uh, you got to file a motion. The way you get the court's attention is called a motion. Now, they, the motions have different names. Order to show cause is the motion, is the form of motions. All right, that means I want, this, I want the hearing now. I want immediate uh, decision. That's what, that's what that means. All right, uh, you could do you could file a notice of motion to dismiss the action for lack of jurisdiction. That means that the, the borrower claimed that it was not served properly. The document just was left at the door. And upon your research at the courthouse, you're looking at this affidavit of service. It says something else, and that's not what happened. So you challenge the jurisdiction. That that buy you some time as well. So that uh, or you could always file bankruptcy. File bankruptcy. Child chapter 13. It automatically stop everything. Now, some people abuse bankruptcy because that's the only thing they know. You know, it's like a gun. You pull it, it's, it's a wrap. But bankruptcy only buys you so much time. All right, bankruptcy has its own rule. Again, I'm a paralegal. I'm a real estate uh, uh, investor trainer. Uh, that's what, this is the, the, my main business. So I understand business organization. I understand uh, litigations. I understand uh, this kind of structure, which qualify me to speak on this subject and and direct you on this situation. Anyway, so that's basically what you have here. In terms of property research, if you're in New York City, once you get a property, property research. All right, the first thing you should do is go into ACRIS. Some people pronounce it ACRIS. ACRIS. It's spelled A C R I S. That um, NYC.gov slash ACRIS. So you can do your property research to verify ownership. Because a lot of time you're going to get a property and they're going to say, oh, I own this property, I own this property. You find out they don't own a property, so you don't want to waste your time. Verify ownership. Verify they own the property and only deal with the property owner directly. Because the bank, if you're going to deal with lenders, you're going to have to uh, um, sign an arm and length transaction. And when you do this transaction with these deals, you want to be protected. You're going to have to get the disclosures signed. You want to be protected as you deal with um, on the legal aspect of this thing. You want to go to Acres. The next area you might want to go is to Property Sharp, Shark.com. If you're in New York, you know what it is. And um, put the block a lot of information on the property. Put the address so you can get a detailed rundown on the mortgages. Which you, that information also will be found on Acres as well. But you want to go to the mortgages to have an idea 
what is currently owed on the mortgage, how many mortgage they have, what kind of agreement is recorded, what's on public record. So, so you can predict what kind of title problem you might have during closing. Because if, if there are outstanding contracts that's currently recorded, if you have outstanding agreement that's in place that you'll know about, it will, it will come up during title. Uh, so the title company will, will not be able to close that property. Again, um, hey Chris, the last but not least, you should always go to MLS Stratus. MLS, if you're a member of MLS, if you have a friend that's a broker, pull the property up and try to get some comps yourself. Get some comparables, see what the property is worth today, what it could be worth down the line, and use your experience. If you're not sure, contact a real estate appraiser to give you confirmation and um, see what's going on, um, see what's going on, see, verify. The property might be listed to a broker or agent already, multiple listing, or it probably was listed prior three or four months down the line. Now, here you are, here you are, get ready to do a short sale. That listing information is going to hurt you because when a broker come out to do a broker price opinion, when an appraiser come out to do a, a BPO, a, you know, appraising a property, that information is going to come up. They're going to use that information to uh, to va make value decision on their on their on your pay on your on your on your short sale, and your deal can go wrong because he could give you a value that's not accurate because he's lazy. He don't want to do his research. He don't want to go through the property himself. That's why get in the habit of getting your own appraiser done. Get in the habit of getting your own engineering inspection done, so we can do comparison. Because if you don't give the bank something to work with, some alternative evidence, then they're going to take what, what the other, whatever the other guy gives them. Hey, my appraiser said the property worth two hundred grand. That's what it is. That's what the bank gonna say. Well, you gonna say, well, my guy said the house only worth one one fifty. Then you could say, you know what? You got two hundred. I got one fifty. Let's come in the middle. It's fifty grand different. You take half. I take half. I pay you one seventy five. Make sense? So you could negotiate. You could go negotiate. That's how negotiation is done. Let's talk about buying the notes. My, which is my favorite strategy for doing real estate. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. I'm not a big short sale fan because. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, they always assume someone's misrepresenting the facts. Uh, some bank always screaming that, oh, he flipped the property. The buyer flipped the property three months down the line, some other line. It was fraud. We could have made $400,000 when he got two hundred grand. Uh, we need to look into this realtor. We need to look into the activities. See, when you, when you purchase the note, you become the bank. Are you going to call the FBI on yourself? No. Nope. Are you going to make a, uh, a claim on yourself? No, because you, you, you're the bank. It's your building. So buy the notes, approach the banks. Listen, uh, I would love to do this deal, but I need to purchase the notes. I need to be in position because that's what my company does. Bayfield Capital, that's what we do. We buy distressed notes from distressed homeowners, distressed property. That's your business. They don't need to go into detail why you're doing what you're doing because when you position yourself to become the bank, because you become the bank, then now... Now you don't have all these other disclosure issues you got. So you could approach the homeowner and say, homeowner, I'm, I'm your now, nah, I'm your banker. I'd like to make your cash. I'm, I'm gonna give you cash money to vacate. You got a family of four, a five, or six, whatever, four kids, two adults. You know, we're gonna get you an apartment where you pay one more rent, one more security, one more broker fee. We're gonna get and pay that for you, fifteen hundred dollars. It's forty five hundred dollars. Pay get that for you. They're also gonna give you another five thousand to get you for your, you know, for your moving expense or whatnot. So we give you ten thousand dollars. So now they're gone. So you could do what you, they sign a deed to you. You record your deed at the courthouse. At the courthouse, now you're in full control. You got the note, you got the deed, then you could do whatever you want to do. If you're buying a deed for $200,000, the property's worth four hundred. dollars you get a homeowner 10000 or twenty grand to vacate, you still did good. Make sense? You go in that property, do the spruce, do the invites, do the invites, and um, get this thing done. Anyway, folks, my name is James Bayfield. Uh, let me. Uh, my goal and objective was to do a, a quick video, and I know I know I say it was a quick video, but I know, um, uh, but I really wanted to educate those brokers out there in New York City, tri-state New York City brokers and short sale agents, and negotiators, and investors about going doing business because I don't want I don't like to see you guys get into legal trouble. You know what I mean? I don't like you guys work with people that don't understand the process. Guys come to your office uh, offering their services and from credit repair to litigation support. You know, when you're in doubt, hire a licensed attorney. Even a, an attorney sometimes, they don't specialize in this kind of business, all right, because it's lengthy. Like, any, like anybody else, attorney needs money. They need cash flow. 
And um, otherwise, they'd be in foreclosure. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, what I mean? They'd, be, they'd be begging the court for mercy. They need cash. They need cash like anybody else to function. All right, so always take that into consideration. My goal and, my goal and objective every day as I get up is to serve you. I want to know what can I do for you today? How can I make your business better? How can I improve your life? How can I make, I can make you a better person? That's my goal. Every day, that's what I go and strive. That's why people can say whatever they want to say about me. It never bother me nothing. They can come and harass me. They come and knock on my door. They go to, they try to find me left and right for whatever reason. It don't bother me. Your problem is not my problem. But I'm here to help you. If you allow me to help you. If your objective is to run some kind of fast one on me, some kind of scheme or abuse and it's not, I, I, people see that a mile away. It's old business. So get rid of that. And focus on, you know what, you need some help? Humble yourself. You, you owe the bank money. You owe the bank money. Put some savings away. Right? Some cash. To, uh, give me some, pass some cash so, so we could negotiate with the lender. All right? And if you're a real estate investor, you know, know what you're willing to spend, what your threshold is. Is that trying to be a fast one? Focus on building a long-term relationship. Six months ago, I told everybody America was on sale. It's time to buy. They was hiding. Now the price is picking back up. Everybody getting oh, scared or want to commit crimes again. You're committing crime without you even know you're committing crime because of your approach in the business. Get educated. Learn. Watch this video over and over again. Watch this video over and over again. I know I, talk a lot, I, I touch a lot of topics. I talk about litigation. I talked about foreclosure, I talked about short sale, I talked about auction, I talked about a way to stop a foreclosure, I talked about note purchase, and I talked about property research. Now, closing the deal, I talked about that, always close with cash. If you're going to do a short sale, deal with cash. If you plan on reselling a property, done a line to avoid problems and keep your receipts, keep your documents, keep everything paper so you could, you could document everything. If you plan, if it's going to be a, a retail buyer, you send a short sale to, you know, set up for a real estate commission, 6%, you know, and um, get the commission. Stay out of trouble. This business, next three to five years, them boys are going to be coming knocking on people's doors again to intimidate you, to harass you, right, because the way you thought you did business. Right now, there's a lot of FHA money on the street. There are people that want to be um, creative. I would advise you be too creative with the income, all right? If they don't make it, don't show it. <laughs> disclose everything, disclosure, disclosure. At the end of the day, folks, disclosure, 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 disclosure. James Bayfield, America's number one short-set debt negotiator, jamesbayfield.com. My goal is to help you become rich, real estate, by